400 Palestinian miners have suffered illegal Israeli incarceration since the start of 2020. The occupation forces continue to target young Palestinians across the occupied territories, with approximately 170 Palestinian children currently suffering behind bars. Palestinian miners from East Jerusalem get pulled out of bed in the middle of the night, needlessly handcuffed, and then made to spend a long time waiting for their interrogation to begin. Only when they are tired and broken are they taken in for lengthy interrogation sessions without being given the opportunity to speak to a lawyer or their parents before the questioning begins and without understanding that they have the right to remain silent. They are then held in detention facilities under harsh conditions for days and weeks. In some cases, all this is attended by threats, verbal and physical abuse before and during the interrogation. Without the protection of their parents or even adults that they can trust and in complete disregard for their youth, the boys have to endure this entire process alone far from their families, away from their normal daily routine and anything familiar. No one explains to them where they are being taken, what they are suspected of, what their rights are, who they may confer with, how long the process will take and when they will return to their families and homes. These practices have Israeli occupation forces free to use pressure to force them to confess. And indeed, many of the detained minors sign involuntary confessions of crimes they never did, which are then used as the basis for indictments against them. All for what? Well, this aspect of life in East Jerusalem cannot be separated from Israel's overall policy in the city. All Israeli occupation forces operating in East Jerusalem follow a policy aimed at encouraging Palestinian residents to leave the city. What better way to terrorize the public than by using their own children as bait? Welcome to the Mideast Stream, I'm Marwa Osman. The use of force, nighttime arrests, questioning not in the presence of their parents, rides in patrol cars for intimidation and unnecessary handcuffing. These are just some of the violations of the rights of Palestinian minors detained by the Israeli occupation forces in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, taken in for lengthy interrogation sessions without being given the opportunity to speak to a lawyer or their parents before the questioning begins. Palestinian kids are then held in detention facilities under harsh conditions for days and maybe weeks. To discuss this issue with us from uh, Palestine, from the West Bank, is Dr. Amal Wahdan, human rights advocate. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Wahdan. Now, Palestinian mar miners from both uh, the uh, uh, eastern part of Jerusalem and the West Bank are being pulled out of bed in the middle of the night. They are being unnecessarily handcuffed. They are being dragged for interrogation, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, away from their parents and away from everything that they really know without the presence of lawyers. Years. During the time of the incarceration, what options do their parents have to try and protect their children from all of this unnecessary terrorism? Um, uh, actually, the, the parents are um, uh, forces. They can't uh, actually do uh, anything in front of this uh, savage uh, uh, raids and um, uh, incarcerations of um, minors. Uh, uh, actually, um, uh, the parents um, uh, uh, try to defend their children while they are at home uh, or uh, in front of their uh, homes. But uh, after the um, soldier, the Israeli soldiers take them away, uh, they can do nothing except, you know, hiring uh, lawyers or going to some um, uh, human rights organizations to help them trace where their children are. So while in detention, they are um, kids are deprived totally um, from getting uh, this legal um, assistance. Um, even the Red Cross sometimes takes them uh, one to two weeks until they can uh, meet their children. Um, and uh, during this time, the uh, Israeli interrogators and the uh, um, Israeli forces uh, can do any can do anything with them. They uh, can int intimidate them. They can threaten them, blackmail them, um, and uh, the kids have actually no um, 
um, except for the knowledge that they get uh, from their peers, but they don't have um, the, the uh, legal knowledge to defend uh, themselves. Um, actually, they are uh, being uh, in this battle on their own while in, uh, in prisons. So you're telling me, Dr. Wahdan, that in 2020, you have people coming over to your house, kidnapping your child at the middle of the night, taking your minor for interrogation for God knows what, trying to embezzle them and trying to terrorize them to make them uh, maybe sign some papers that would later on be used as an indictment against them. If this is happening in the world, any other place in the world, the entire globe would go crazy. Why is Israel allowed to get away with this violation of basic human rights uh, well if we um, uh, if we compare what happens uh, in the US during Trump or even before that what happens to minors and what happens to um, minorities and um, um, you know people of uh, color mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how the authorities are treating them how the police forces are treating them we can get the picture very clear here they have a free hand you know the interrogators the police forces the soldiers here have a free hand because they have a cover-up and who is covering up uh, their uh, um, you know their uh, terrorizing and their criminal acts against uh, palestinian minors uh, women um, uh, old people um, they have nothing actually um, to stop them because uh, the u.s is backing them up and the rest of the NATO countries, the rest of um, the allied forces, uh, which are led by the U.S., is defending them. The U.N., actually, and um, uh, international human rights has piles of uh, cases uh, that um, uh, shows and um, is a, um, a solid evidence mm -hmm. of um, crimes that has been committed uh, against uh, um, minors. Um, which do not get anywhere. All these reports, all these statistics that are sitting in the, you know, in the drawers and offices of uh, the UN uh, human rights offices, um, do not get any uh, legal, um, uh, let's say, any uh, legal uh, follow-up in order to put an end to these uh, violations of human rights and uh, violations of. Uh, uh, international law. So mm -hmm. Israel is, goes, you know, unpunished, unaccountable for all its crimes, killing uh, young, youth, um, actually keeping the bodies of uh, the martyrs of Palestinian children. Until now, we have like more than 50 um, uh, bodies of uh, children who are who have been martyred uh, in uh, 2015 and the, the families cannot get their uh, you know their uh, bodies to there are a lot of scandals them, affiliated them, with these cases uh, with a lot of them being uh, organ trafficking by the israeli related. entity but th these practices leave the occupation forces as you said free to pressure uh, to uh, the kids the families and to make them connect Confess. And indeed, at some point, of some course. kids actually uh, sign involuntarily uh, confessions, which are used, uh, uh, basically they are written in a different language than that that they know. And they are obviously uh, false ones, but the kids are intimidated to do so, which are then used as a basis of indictments against these kids, which could actually lead them to be behind bars for more than 20 years, according to the age of the kid. But why bear all this cost? I mean, they're definitely paying a lot of money to do this. Why? Why are they bearing all this cost? I mean, uh, what young kids are confessing to crimes that they have nothing to do with? What are the Israelis actually achieving by this specific act of intimidation and terrorism? Um, uh, actually, they want to terrorize and intimidate the kids so they don't throw stones. That's the major, you know, the major um, accusations that they use against these kids. Because what? what what else do they have except for throwing stones at the soldiers when they, um, you know, when they uh, barge in into their homes or into their villages or into their um, olive yard uh, fields? That's the only thing that they have. They want to defend themselves from the uh, assaults of these uh, soldiers or settlers. Uh, in this case, it's during this last, uh, um, you know, during this season of um, olive picking, um, so many 
people have been, um, you know, uh, documented as being targeted by settlers and by soldiers, and uh, been uprooted or burned while the people are uh, trying to uh, protect it. But of course, they can't do much. And confession by kids uh, at um, during interrogations is very famous for the best like four or five decades. Mm -hmm. They try to use this to force kids because, uh, uh, of course, uh, they want to uh, close the case and send them to to prison. But uh, with um, throwing stones, no, I don't think that there is any uh, any charge in the whole world uh, that puts kids behind bars for throwing uh, a stone. But of course, they fabricate allegations and accus accusations against against these, uh, uh, you know, um, peaceful kids who, who are uh, trying to defend their um, olive fields or mm -hmm. trying to defend their. Um, uh, fathers, while they uh, the soldiers trying to arrest their fathers, so um, these um, crim criminal acts or, or um, actually um, uh, war crimes and um, uh, crimes against humanity that are committed by uh, the Israelis are um, uh, not being uh, accountable and not being addressed by the IC ICC, for example. Mm -hmm. Because to go to, to this uh, court, you need years and years and with lots of evidence, especially with uh, martyrs, for example. We, uh, in our case, our foundation, Sheikh Hassan Foundation, has been following some cases of uh, uh, martyrdom or uh, even severe um, uh, um, wounds by the uh, Israeli soldiers, and it, it doesn't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. It stays there. It basically starts no with the fact that Israel no one, actually does no not. Cares. It starts with the fact that Israel does not even recognize the ICC for that matter or any other uh, international of community, course. if you will, uh, body, which I hate that word, by the way. It's just a couple of countries in the West deciding over what happens in our region, especially in uh, occupied Palestine. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Amal Wahdan, human rights advocate, for speaking to us about the horrific uh, incidents that the young people of Palestine, the youth of Palestine, is going through because of the Israeli occupation forces. Thank you for being with us. Now, please stay tuned. Next, we will talk about Lebanon. Now, as the efforts to form a Lebanese government headed by Saad al-Hariri falter, the media silence regarding the government formation directly and openly between the president of the country, Michel Aoun, and the prime minister-designate Saad al-Hariri has changed from a positive issue in terms of preventing confusions to a negative issue after several weeks had passed without any hopeful signs emerging as gossip, rumors, and misinformation multiplied without any clarifications being issued by those involved in the pressing file of government formation. Hariri is stuck in government formation in Lebanon in this following report. Lebanon is currently experiencing a gradual deterioration towards the abyss in light of its political stalemate, financial and economic hardships, and the lack of a support program from the international community as the required reforms have not yet been achieved. November 19 last week saw a sudden increase in the dollar exchange rate, which reached 8,200 Lebanese pounds on the black market before dropping slightly. The rate had dropped to under 7,000 Lebanese pounds less than a month ago when Saad al-Hariri was assigned to form a new government based on the French Rescue Initiative on October 22nd. However, that has yet to happen, with the efforts to form a Lebanese government headed by Saad al-Hariri faltered so far. Several factors have been influencing this trend. However, it is the external interference that is lockjamming any political development in Lebanon, especially after the new U.S. sanctions imposed against the head of the Free Patriotic Movement former minister Gibran Basile. Beginning with the continuous U.S. pressure on every prime minister designate so far to limit the representation of Hezbollah in the government formation process and to deny it ministerial positions despite the fact that Hezbollah has the majority in the Lebanese parliament. Add to that the external influence in the form of continuous Arab and Gulf messages to Hariri, making it clear to him that there will be no change in the currently adopted policy towards Lebanon and therefore no aid unless there is a change in the Lebanese government's dealing with Arab and Persian Gulf files. 
Mind you, all the while, the international community is also warning that Lebanon will not receive any kind of aid and financial loans unless it forms a new government that is trusted internally and internationally and is particularly capable of launching the much-needed reform workshop on various levels. Faced with this reality, Prime Minister-designate Saad al-Hariri is between a rock and a hard place. He feels obliged to succumb to external pressure while the internal political demands puts the future of the entire country on the line. A decisive week ahead for Lebanese Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri, he either fails to form a government or he will form one that resembles its predecessors in both form and terms of power and lose all foreign support. Now with us to discuss this issue from Beirut is Dr. Omar Nashebi, who is an academic and a writer. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Nashebi. Now, observers of the Lebanese political uh, dilemma believe that the external influence in the form of continuous U.S. pressure on Lebanon to uh, main, uh, would be the main reason behind why Saad Hariri has uh, failed so far to uh, formulate a government, specifically uh, as far as the U.S. openly aiming to limit the representation of Hezbollah and any of their allies at this point uh, in the executive authority and to deny them what they call sensitive ministries, whatever that means. If that is the case, then can we say that actually there's no hope for anyone, even it's Hariri himself, to actually formulate a government in Lebanon with these pressures on the table? Yes, well, unfortunately, amidst the crisis that we're going through in Lebanon, the economic crisis, the uh, the, the spread of the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus and the port explosion, uh, amidst all this, I feel that, yes, uh, there's a lot of inter international pressure and international interference in uh, Lebanese affairs. In fact, the only initiative uh, to move forward is a French initiative, not even a local one. And Mr. Hariri uh, was designated as prime minister. He's fine. It, uh, he's having a lot of difficulties to form the government because there are demands apparently by foreign powers that are pressuring him not to have, um, you know, Hezbollah represented in the government. Well, uh, I think that what I heard in the recent days in Beirut is that uh, there is no problem. This issue can be resolved easily. Hezbollah does not have to have ministers from its, uh, I mean, party members as uh, members of parliament. We have to remember that Hezbollah is a party representative presented in parliament so many people who voted for Hezbollah are not necessarily Hezbollah party members mm -hmm. so there are many supporters of Hezbollah who are not party members and who are not directly linked to Hezbollah and they can be represented in the government now this is making it more difficult for uh, you know some western powers that are pressuring for uh, you know to deprive any representation of anyone who supports the resistance in the government that's mm -hmm. practically impossible so yes there is a problem and there is a complicated uh, situation here. There's a lot of external pressure and Mr. Hariri perhaps doesn't have the uh, the, the actual uh, power or the position to take a strong stance and uh, refuse these uh, or reject these external pressures on him apparently. But, Hence, well, uh, we would add maybe more a bit to the external U.S. pressure also to the pressure from the European uh, countries from the international community to be honest with you because they keep pressuring Lebanon telling them that you will receive no aid no financial loans whatsoever unless there's a government formed and unless that government is trusted both internally and internationally. I don't know why yes, it well, should be trusted internationally, but in particularly capable of launching what they call the reform workshop on various level. So it seems like one huge loop of inaction here. I mean, honestly, what options does Saad Hariri have at the well, moment uh, he, as the country actually is heading to a financial disaster? Yes, uh, he has one uh, main uh, uh, way to go forward if he wants to go forward if, or if he has the capacity to go forward and that's a democratic process there is a system in Lebanon there's a constitution and the prime minister before forming the, the government according to the constitution has to do consultations with the various political groups and various coalitions in parliament and form the president based on their recommendations their recommendations are on the table he knows the recommendations and therefore he's supposed to form a government based on the constitution process if he doesn't do that I mean he can actually face these uh, European and Western powers by telling them, would you like me, I mean, would you like a democratic process in Lebanon or a dictatorship? Now, 
Now here is the situation. He puts them on the, uh, on uh, the spot, uh, on the spot by mm -hmm. saying, if you would like to have a democratic process, Hezbollah is a party that was uh, voted in Lebanon democratically. They, they were, actually have they the, were the European observers. Of parliament. They were, they were, uh, they were European observers at that time when the elections True. took place. So therefore, Hezbollah is a representative of the people. I mean, if you don't like Hezbollah, you have to change people's votes. So maybe you can change the uh, people's choices in the next elections. That's a different process. But yes, for now, they've, they've been doing uh, this the wrong way by yes, sanctioning I know, the entire and country. Spending, but let us dive you know, a bit into the major internal difficulties here that's happening between uh, certain parties and the prime minister designate, especially talking about the struggle between the future movement, uh, which is head by prime minister uh, designate Hariri and the free patriotic movement led by former minister Gibran Basir. Well, I what's, feel, what's that yeah, feud about? Well, I feel part of this uh, this uh, this kind of uh, you know confrontation between uh, the uh, the future movement and the free patriotic movement is about power sharing. I mean, uh, you know, the, this is what we say in Lebanon is that the, the country, one of the biggest flaws in the system, in the government system in this country is that it's based on power sharing between the various communities, between Sunni Muslims and the uh, Maronite Christians and Shia Muslims and sectarian, this, power, uh, sectarian power sharing. Sectarian power sharing. And that sectarian religious power, power sharing does not actually constitute a, a solid grounds for building a nation that is uh, uh, capable of having all the mechanisms of accountability activated because the mechanisms of accountability cannot be cannot allow some people who are doing corruption to hide behind their uh, confessional identity you know and that's what's happening in Lebanon so they're doing this uh, the sharing between the various religious uh, sectarian groups and that that that, that does not build solid grounds for mm -hmm. uh, moving forward I mean and uh, like uh, Sayyid Abbas Musawi said in the 90s mm -hmm. when the Taif agreement was passed Sayyid Abbas Musawi was the he martyr who, warned he it. warned that the, the Taif agreement since it is based the constitution amendments that were done in the 90s since they're based on power sharing by the different religious and sectarian group they will actually lead to more problems and reach more disagreements they will between never the various build a viable country group. but yes. one also something that's interesting that we have less than two minutes here that sure. I heard last week was from the UN special coordinator for Lebanon uh, John Kubis who lamented the absence of functioning government uh, functioning government in the country mm -hmm. especially in the aftermath of the deadly uh, uh, August 4th uh, explosion, but he said that he had briefed the UN Security Council about the lack of progress in Lebanon. I mean, hold on a second. What does he mean? I mean, first of all, yes. in what position is he to start giving such reports to the UNSC? That's one. And number two, is he basically signaling for a possible more role for the UN by the UNIFIL that are on the ground in Lebanon? That's very dangerous. I, I don't think so. I think that maybe what we would like him to uh, to talk uh, to be uh, meaning, I hope that he means the the Security Council Resolution 242-339-194. These are Security Council resolutions that have to apply and that Israel has been violating for so long. Israel is the uh, entity that has been violating international law more than any other entity in the whole region. So therefore, to actually talk about Security Council resolution. What if he means the 1701, though? Well, yes, let's, uh, let's okay, okay, 1701 came resolution. after. I think we should go, we should go in line. 242-338-194 are resolutions that have been violated for for more than three decades. So I think it is about time for these resolutions to start applying these resolutions and then all the other uh, resolutions will be will, will follow and 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 they wouldn't be necessary. Actually, I have to say something at the end mm -hmm. is that, that there wouldn't be any armed resistance if there was no occupation. Uh, uh, occupation. And aggression. Exactly. We still so are therefore, not being able to implement the 425 resolution up until 425 now. was applied by the force of the resistance exactly. according to exactly. chapter and seven, uh, chapter seven, right fully, to the I may, We still have uh, countries, the, the uh, farms, the countryside yes. villages that are still occupied. I want to thank you very much for thank this you. very, very uh, uplifting, first of all, conversation with you, Dr. Amar Nashebe, and uh, hopeful for an upcoming government if it might uh, be happening in Beirut to try and salvage what's left of the economy and the financial institutions in the country. Thank you very much for being with us, and please stay tuned next week for more from the Middle East stream.